Here we go. So for for yeah, it, no, it's 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 recording. Okay. So for everybody that uh, is joining us late, hopefully I get to post it online. Otherwise, it won't be there. And maybe it's not supposed to be there. Maybe it's only for us in class today. There's a lot of stuff in here. I probably get kicked off of YouTube anyway. No, actually, I don't think I would. But um, <laughs> let's uh, let's let I because I, I've spent the time here trying to avoid that. But uh, our last days alert as we go through uh, this today, and um, there's, a, there's just so much I have. We're, we're not going to get through all of it, but um, we'll do the best we can. Also, um, before we get started, the first category that we're in is Israel, as you see online. But um, shift two, do that. Um, the... Uh, the um, um, oh, next week is uh, is Thanksgiving. Um, I'm going to take next week off, so uh, we won't have class in here. If I have time, uh, I'll uh, I'll try to put something online. If not, then we're just going to take next week off. Just uh, I put a lot of weeks in a row, and so this this weekend I'm just going to spend with the family and not uh, and not teach. So so we are going to do that. But then the following week we're going to open up with Titus, and uh, so that's a new book for us. That I'm mean, not Titus. We'll open up with Second Timothy, his, Paul's final letter, and he says a lot about about the end times and what what uh, even Timothy should be looking out for within the church. And so we'll be uh, getting into that uh, that following week, and then. I will be doing Growing Families, in which I'm doing kind of a, uh, a look at the Holy Spirit and the battles that we will probably be having, uh, considering some of these events of the last days, the battles that we'll have in our own families and our own with growing couples, you know. So, um, so and that's, what's, that's what's ahead. Now, to the last days alert in Israel. Um, we have... Um, the uh, first thing is a stone quarry uh, from the Second Temple area in Jerusalem is discovered, and this is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, pay attention to that big giant stone up top where they uh, have a little measuring stick there uh, next to it. As we uh, look at this, uh, this is what the article says. Israel uh, Antiquities Authority, the IAA archaeologists exploring an area of Jerusalem where a parking lot will soon be installed, have uncovered something historically significant. Significant. Working on the grounds of the Mount, uh, not sure how you say that, Hufsum, whatever, industrial park, they excavated the remains of an ancient quarry in Jerusalem that was used to supply uh, construction materials during the period of the Second Temple, which ran from 516 B.C. to 70 A.D. It says, fittingly, the ancient Jerusalem quarry was dug up in a neighborhood known as Har uh, Hosvim, it says, which means Quarryman's Hill. Well, maybe there's a reason it was named that, right, way back way back when. So anyway, in English, it says, this is one of many quarries that have been found north of uh, the old city of Jerusalem, where the precious building materials known as Jerusalem limestone was harvested, harvested for centuries. Building blocks in various stages of working were discovered in the quarry. It says the biggest of these stone uh, blocks were uh, were truly massive. It says they measured nearly seven feet, two meters long, and five feet, 1.5 meters wide, and could have weighed uh, several tons if they'd ever been fully detached and lifted out. It says the size of these stones uh, that it or it is the size of these stones that has allowed the IAA experts to date the quarry to the second temple era. This is the one uh, time in Jerusalem's long history that such large blocks would have been needed for multiple construction projects. It is likely that the use of the quarry was especially uh, heavy during the late Second Temple period when Judea's King Herod went on a mon monumental building spree. So a lot of the, the, the construction that was done during that time was, was caused by that. So one of the interesting things, and this is like at least the third quarry that they found that I know of that, uh, that has 
they can see this is where the stone comes from. Well, they're going to want to probably rebuild the third temple with these stones. And to have this is, it, it means something. And then the Sanhedrin, uh, this article just came out uh, November 16th uh, from Israel 365. The Sanhedrin begins to prepare oil to anoint King uh, um, Messiah. And it says, uh, Cohen got all. And this is what that article says. After an exhaustive study into the details surrounding the oil used, exhaustive study, we find it right here in our Bibles, but that is where they looked. It says the um, uh, uh, Cohen uh, Gadol, high priest, and uh, kings of Israel, the Sanhedrin, is moving forward to prepare enough to anoint the Messiah from this is kind of interesting, from the house of David, who, when he returns, will rule over Israel in the Messianic era. Remember, the Jewish people still are looking for the first coming of the Messiah, and they're thinking he's coming soon. And this is what they're preparing for right now. The anointing oil was described in the Bible to be used um, in the uh, consecration of the temple. It says, um, make of... Uh, Make of this a sacred anointing oil, um, a compound of ingredients uh, expertly blended to serve as uh, sacred anointing oil. And that's their quote from Exodus uh, 30, 25. Originally, uh, the oil was used exclusively for the priest and the tabernacle articles, but it was uh, later... Um, extended to uh, include prophets and kings. It says Samuel, who took a flak, flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Hashim, uh, herewith anoints you ruler over his own people from 1 Samuel 10.1. It says, it is expressively expressly forbidden by the Bible to recreate the oil for any other purpose, punishable by karith. And that's, it means to be cut off is, is what that means in the uh, Hebrew. The most severe punishment described in the Bible, um, the ingredients as described in Exodus 30, uh, 23 through 25, uh, are as follows, and it talks about pure mirth and, and the amount, 500 shekels in weight and uh, sweet cinnamon and then fragrant uh, cane, sometimes translated, and that's what it says in my New King James Version as uh, camelus. It says uh, casa um, or cassia, 500 shekels, and then it says specially prepared olive oil, one hen, it tells the amount. All the ingredients must be prepared in uh, total purity. The Sanhedrin has already overseen the production of uh, uh, ritual pure olive oil suited for use in the temple uh, menorah. So that's, they have that oil. It says it is important to note that the oil was called in Hebrew, and I can't read the Hebrew there, but Shaim uh, uh Meshach. Uh, hang on, I know what that is. Um, I'll, uh, Hang on, I'll, I'll get it in a minute because it, it'll come to me how you say that. Um, literally translated oil of anointing. Uh, yeah, that's it. The Hebrew word for Messiah is, um, why am I blanking on how to say this? Mashiach. Yeah, Mashiach. Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the Prince. Yeah, uh, Mashiach. It says literally the anointed one through the term also used in the Bible for anyone who has been anointed. So it's really interesting if you go back to to the, the verse where they first make the oil and they anoint uh, Aaron, right, as a high priest. It says, Mashiach Aaron. So they mashiach Aaron. They anointed him, and we call the Messiah. They Messiahed Aaron. Isn't that funny? As the high priest. That, that's what that would say, is they Messiahed the high priest, Aaron. And uh, I just find it interesting because they're waiting on the Messiah, and so that's, that's I don't know, some some interest, I think, in, in, in how they say that. But anyway, Rabbi Hillel Weiss, the spokesman for the Sanhedrin, announced the beginning of the anointing oil project last week, uh, appropriately enough, just before the holiday of Hanukkah in a sermon he gave on the Temple Mount. Says Rabbi Weiss, emphasized that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, it says, and the temple utensils will be anointed when the temple service begins, which does not need the actual temple structure, only an altar. 
And I thought that was also interesting. It says, also, all who survive of all those nations that come up against uh, Jerusalem, it says, shall make a pilgrimage year by year to bow low to the king, uh, king, lord of hosts, and to observe the festival of Sukkot. Um, that's Zechariah 14, 16. That is where it specifically mentions in the millennial reign that when they have this feast of Sukkot or tabernacles, uh, that they will all come from many nations. And those who do not as in, it gives an example, if, if the nation of, is, of Egypt does not come, that the Lord will withhold the rain. This is during the millennial rain, during his, his rain, not rain, R-A-I-N, but um, during the millennial rain. Um, but uh, during that time, he will withhold rain, R-A-I-N, from, from Egypt during that time if they don't come. And anyway, says, we are now entering the time when the preparations for the temple are almost complete, Rabbi Weiss said. Now is the time for people to act to show whether they will be part of the temple or stand against the reappearance of God's house in Jerusalem. Very interesting that you have this group, the Sanhedrin, uh, that is reformed, that is preparing the oils and the, and, and the utensils are ready and everything's ready. They're like, we've got almost everything ready. We're waiting on the Messiah. He's coming soon and you're going to stand on one side. Either we're going to rebuild this temple or you're going to be on the other side. There's a lot of lines being drawn, even among the Jews and certainly on the Christian side as well. It's like, no, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No other way will you enter into heaven but by him and so they're they're looking and saying yes we're waiting on the messiah not recognizing that the messiah is is jesus so a couple interesting uh uh, verses from that it says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, this is Jesus speaking, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. It says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So this is now Daniel talking about this abomination that causes desolation. It says, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice. That's one week of years, seven years. In the middle of that, at three and a half years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, which means sacrifice and offering must be going on at least by mid-tribulation period. And on the wing of abominations, because he's going to declare himself to be God from there, it says, will be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Then, in Daniel 12, uh, so later on in Daniel, we, he we hear this, verse 11 of Daniel 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. An interesting number, as we know that throughout the three and a half years in a 360 day year is 1,260 days. So we have this extra 70 days. It's actually broken up into two groups. It's broken up into 30 and then plus another 45 right there in Daniel chapter 12. And it tells you, it alludes to perhaps why. I believe that's when uh, during that time period, perhaps the um, the instructions, which we have from Ezekiel, the end of Ezekiel for the uh, millennial temple may be, be be set out, as well as I think the sheep and the goat judgment is probably taking place during that time. Don't know that for sure. We don't know. It's an unknown. It's a, just this odd number of 70 days that we don't have anything else really specifically to nail it down. But we do know from, um, from Matthew uh, that there will be this this division and this judgment, the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goat, you know, how have you treated these, the least of my brethren? That's how, what's going to determine whether or not you can enter into the millennial kingdom. So there's, a, and, it, and the way it's asked, it's individual almost. So it's, it's almost like, you know, it's not like as, a, it could be as a nation, but literally each person will have to answer for themselves as to, because some will be saying, oh, no, 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 we followed you, we're believers, we're believers, and he'll say, no, you're not. You haven't done any of these things. And so God knows, and he'll be judging the heart. So perhaps during that extra days, that's what will be happening. But the interesting thing that I have 
here from uh, Revelation and why I put the picture there is notice uh, what is on the Temple Mount, right? So we all know that uh, what sits there is, is a Muslim temple. And this is what it says in Revelation about the temple that exists during that time in which the Antichrist will come up and declare himself to be God in. It says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God um, the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is um, outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they shall tread uh, the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So it looks like during this time, or, or that this temple is, this courtyard will be trodden down. Many then Bible prophecy people say, well, right there in this big area that you see, you can put the temple there and they could both coexist, but the outer court couldn't fit there because, well, in this case, you might have a Muslim temple there. Now, that may not be true. It may, this may allude to something else It might, but right now, both could coexist at the same time and it would fulfill Revelation uh, chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. So anybody have anything before we get to the next set subject matter? So this is Israel. So various things are happening and we're not even talking about Ezekiel 38 right now and some of the other wars that are coming up, but we'll see some things that allude to that here in the next subject. So if nobody has anything, let's go on. So this next one is the world. So these are world events, big things that are happening in the world. We're going to talk about two major players today that I typically don't talk about every day in our last day's alert, but you've known, you've seen their names over and over and over again. The first person is George, George Soros. And so um, this is an article that was written uh, actually some years ago, but it, it kind of goes into his background, and I have actually a lot more on that, so I'll uh, keep that out for this. It says, Soros, a Hungarian by birth, has Jewish roots and changed his name from Schwartz to avoid the German uh, uh, persecution of the Jews in the 1930s. He is a multi-billionaire, non-practicing Jew who has fully embraced atheism. He is a socialist leaning towards Marxism and loathes the capitalistic United States. In 1944, Soros worked under Adolf Eichmann in Hungary during World War II and has referred to that year as one of the best years of his life. Eichmann was overseeing the murder of 500,000 Jews while at the same time uh, confiscating their property. So it's a bit difficult to understand why Mr. Soros calls it a great year. After World War II, Soros attended the London School of Economics where he was tutored by the uh, uh, infamous atheist uh, Karl Popper, learning how to implement and manage uh, social engineering. It says Soros was involved in a huge, uh, hugely financial and, and hugely financial benefit from the collapse of the former Soviet empire, as well as the financial problems in Thailand and Malaysia. Thai activist uh, Wing uh, George, yeah, whatever, uh, said, um, we uh, regard George Soros as a kind of Dracula. He sucks the blood from the people. The Russians uh, are s so mad at Soros that they uh, issued an arrest warrant for him, calling him an, quote unquote, international financial terrorist. They claim the Russian Secret Service found that he was using fo uh, foreign currency uh, derivatives to uh, start an attack on the Russian current on the Russian currency shares in the market. It says, when you throw uh, in his roles in the financial problems of Yugoslavia, uh, Georgia, Hungary, Ukraine, and Myanmar, formerly Burma, it says you can better understand why and how his tightening uh, tentacles of globalization and the new world order give him more and more power. Some of the other uh, things in that says, uh, by source own admission, he helped engineer uh, coups in Slovakia, uh, Croatia, Georgia, and Yugoslavia. When Soros uh, targets a country for a regime change, he begins by creating a shadow government and a full formed government in exile ready to assume power when the opportunity arises. Uh, that article went on to say, uh, Richard Poe writes, Soros, pri uh, private philanthropy totaling 
uh, nearly five, uh, yeah, totaling n- nearly five billion dollars, um, continues undermining America's traditional Western values. Um, his giving has provided funding for abortion rights, atheism, uh, drug legalization, sex education, euthanasia. Uh, feminism, gun control, globalization, mass migration, gay marriage, and other radical experiments in social engineering. It says he heavily supports MoveOn.org, uh, Media Matters for America, the Tides Foundation, uh, the ACLU, ACORN, Planned Parenthood, and Ocup- the Occupy Movement, and many more. Um, in summary, it says Soros is anti-American, anti-Christian, and it goes on. Um, Glenn Beck had done a, uh, in 2010, had done a little uh, story on uh, Soros, and, um, oh, I have, yeah, I won't read that. Um, and, and one of the things that he said is how, how does he go about country after country kind of destroying them. And this is he, he and this is in 2010, so this is, what, 11 years ago. It, and this is what he says. This is how he operates. It says, in, a, in country after country, we found that there are five steps uh, to him gaining control. It says, he does it over and over and over again. So let's see uh, what the steps are and let's, uh, and let's, I think I'm missing something. If he's done any of see if it, he's done any of them here, it says. Um, the first one is from, is uh, f- form a shadow government using humanitarian aid as cover. And then step two, it says he controls the airwaves, funding existing radio, TV outlets to take control over them and uh, or start your own outlets. And we've certainly seen uh, plenty of that, even the Young Turks TV or or RT RT Russia TV thing that we can we can find all that on the, on on the internet. Anyway, uh, three steps. Uh, step three: destabilize the state, weaken the government, and build an anti-government kind of feeling in this country. You exploit an economics crisis or take advantage of uh, of existing crisis. It says pressure from the top. And from the bottom, this will allow you to weaken the government and build anti-government public sentiment. Step four, you provoke an election crisis. Step five, take power. Um, you, you stage massive demonstrations, civil disobedience, sit-ins, general strikes. Uh, you encourage uh, activism. You promote voter fraud and tell uh, followers uh, what to do uh, through your radio and television stations. Uh, kind of interesting. As you follow that, you say, okay, I've seen kind of this game plan play out. So this is one man. It's hard to believe that one man could have so much control. But with money, you know, you're able to d- influence a lot of people, and he's been able to do that. But we've got uh, we've got probably even a bigger guy on the stage as far as who's been working also for a long time at this, um, and that is uh, Klaus Schwab. So Exposed, this article is written November 10th of this year by Michael Lloyd from uh, RAI. Our foundation. Um, but anyway, says uh, Klaus Schwab's School for COVID uh, Dictators Plan for Great Reset. So it says uh, economist Ernest Wolf believes that a hidden alliance of political and cor- uh, corporate leaders is uh, ex- ex- uh, exploiting the pandemic and the aim of crashing national economies. Uh, and introducing a global digital currency. Now, this is a long article, and I'm using a lot of it because I think he makes a lot of valid points that we should keep in mind. So this uh, Michael uh, Lord really has written quite a bit in, in here that I think is, is really quite interesting. Uh, the first, uh, uh, he begins and, and says, how is it that more than 190 governments from all over the world ended up dealing with the, uh, for, for YouTube's sake, if I get it posted on there later, uh, the uh, Charlie Oster Victor 019er, we'll call it pandemic, and in almost exactly the same manner, with lockdowns, mass mandates, and vaccination cards now being commonplace everywhere. The answer may lie in the Young Global Leaders School, which was established and managed by Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, and that many of today's prominent political business leaders uh, pass through it on their way to the top. So the mysterious beginnings, they start about, talk a little bit about uh, um, him early on. It says the story begins with the World Economic Forum, which is a NGO foundation uh, founded by, or 
NGO founded by Klaus Schwab, a German economist and mechanical engineer in Switzerland in 1971, so all the way back to 1971 when he was only 32. The WEF is best known to the public for uh, the annual uh, conferences it holds in Davos, Switzerland each January that aim to bring together political and business leaders from around the world to discuss uh, the problems of the day. Today, it is one of the most important networks in the world for the globalist power elite uh, being funded by approximately a thousand uh, um, multinational corporations. Um, the forum initially only brought together people from the economic field, but before long it began attracting politicians, prominent uh, figures from the media, including the BBC and CNN and uh, even celebrities. Uh, that article also talks about um, in the process there was originally called the European Management Forum until 1987. So if you ever heard of that before 1987, that is the same thing as the WEF. Um, uh, and it brought together at that time four. So in 1987, it had 440 executives from 31 nations. Oh, no, I'm sorry. In 1971, he had 440 executives from 31 nations. So here this young 30, what did they say he was, 32-year-old guy was able to bring together uh, some some bigwigs as early as 1971 about that. The, that um, in his contacts that probably made that available to him was his university education, studying uh, with, um, well, the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State at the time, Henry Kissinger. So he studied with Henry Kissinger, so you can see, start to begin to see how he might have had some context, certainly in the, in the political uh, and, and business environment at that time. So then uh, it goes on to say, in 1992, Schwab established a parallel uh, institution, the Global Leaders for Tomorrow School, which was reestablished as the Young Global Leaders in 2004. Attendees at the school must apply for admission and are then subjected to a rigorous uh, uh, selection process. It says members of the school's very first class in 1992 already included many who went on to become important liberal political figures, such as Angela uh, Merkel, uh, Nicholas Sark. Uh, Sarko Sarkozy and Tony Blair. There are currently about 1,300 graduates from the school and the list of alumni includes uh, several names of those who went on to become leaders of health institutions uh, of their re uh, representative nations. It says for the uh, four of them are former and current health ministers ministers for Germany, including uh, Jen Spahn, who has been the federal minister of health since 2018, uh, Philip Rosser, who was the minister of health from 2009 until 2011, um, was appointed the WEF's managing director by Schwab in 2014. Other notable, na notable names on the school's roster include uh, Jacques uh, Jacques Kanda Ardern, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who's, and we've seen what's happened in New Zealand, total complete lockdown, even with one person. Anyway, uh, whose stringent lockdown measures have been uh, praised by global health authorities, Emmanuel Macron, the President of France, Sebastian Kurz, who was until recently the Councillor of Austria, and we just saw what's, if you've been watching the news, what's going on in Austria right now, um, including protests because of their, their lockdowns. Victor Orban, Prime Minister of Hungary, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, and the President of the European uh, Commission, and Andrea uh, Bayerbach, the leader of the German Greens, who was uh, the party's first candidate for, uh, for chancellor in the, in the year's uh, federal election, and who is still in the running to be Merkel's successor. We also find California Governor Gavin Newsom on the list, who was selected uh, for the class of 2005, as well as former presidential candidates and current UN, uh, U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Peter uh, Buttigieg, um, who is a very recent alumnus. It says, having been selected uh, for the class of 2019, all of these politicians who were in office during the past two years have forced harsh responses to the Charlie Oster Victor 019er <laughs> pandemic. And, uh, and 
uh, with which also happened to uh, considerably increase their respective government power. So this is um, this is interesting. He believes that um, uh, Wolf believes that Schwab himself is uh, is one making decisions, but is uh, merely a facility. So they don't think that he's like making all decisions. He's just kind of the top dog of the thing. Also in 2012, Schwab uh, uh, and the WF founded another institution, the Global Shapers Community, uh, which brought together people that were under 30 and approximately 10,000 participants uh, have passed through that program to date. Um, and uh, the future political leaders are being selected, or Wolf believes, and vetted and groomed uh, for positioning in the world's political apparatus for the future. So he's got 10,000 other people that are that are all under 30 that are they've got ready to go into the world, the whole world, not just here. So um, it talked about uh, Change.org uh, with Soros. Also, he's also a big computer. Con contributor to that. Um, actually, he one of the graduates, Gregory uh, Gregor Hammack, is the German chief of Change.org, and he passed through their system uh, on that. Wolf believes that it's possible these people were selected to do uh, due to their willingness to do whatever they're told. That's what the person who wrote this article is kind of. Um, projecting or thinks based on on all his research but it says meeting several times over the course of the year including a 10-day executive training session at the harvard business school that's what they do with all this they put them through the harvard business school they have this special 10-day thing the graduates then establish contacts who they rely on later in their careers and the example of that is emmanuel macron and peter Buttigieg, uh, for example were selected for the school uh, less than five years ago and we already see them certainly in there and their current board of trustees of the of the World Economic Forum includes names like uh, Christine Lagarde, the former managing director of the International Monetary Fund. So there they're in with the money, too. And current president of the European Central Bank, uh, Queen uh, uh, Rana of Jordan. So uh, uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock who has come, come through that, so there you go, which handles nearly $9 trillion annually, BlackRock. So $9 trillion this is one thing. He So he's come through that. Now keep that person in mind, just as maybe I uh, have a, a, another article coming up, um, and uh, just keep him in mind just because of the, the trillion dollar wealth and that uh, Larry Fink had gone through that. Elite universities play a role in the process. Harvard Business School, which I already mentioned, Harvard School of Public Health, was renamed Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health uh, when it received $350 million from, from him who went through this program. Uh, Bloomberg uh, School of Public Health, uh, Michael Bloomberg's uh, donated $1.8 billion to the school in 2018. Um, 1,500 uh, private jets, by the way, we had talked about 450 maybe maybe that went to the, the COP26 uh, conference. 1,500 go every year to Switzerland. So you've got people coming from all over with certainly the means of taking their private jets there um, uh, that, that come into the Switzerland airport. So uh, to fill, facilitate further high-level uh, cooperation, uh, big business, uh, uh, well, national governments, it says Wolf mentions global leaders, alumnus Bill Gates, for example, has long been uh, doing business with Pfizer because he starts to talk in this article about how they're involved with healthcare and uh, and the whole mRNA uh, um, that that they had been using in Africa even before the current the current crisis. So uh, Larry Fink is uh, is presently, of course, the largest advisor to the world's central banks and has been collecting data on world financial system uh, now for more than 30 years. This is the trillion air or tr has access to trillions of dollars right through BlackRock. So that's that's kind of interesting. Let's move on and look at a few of the others. But the school's list of uh, alumni is not limited to political leaders. We also find many of the, um, the captains of private industry, including Bill Gates, which I just mentioned. Amazon's Jeff Bezos, Virgin's Richard Branson, right, of Virgin Atlantic, um, the uh, Clinton Foundation's uh, Chelsea Clinton, so there's a nun 
another young up and comer, right? Again, all of them expressed support for a global response to the pandemic and many reaped uh, considerable profits as a result of the measures. If you did not see this week, Glenn Beck's two hour special on the tracing some of this whole our current situation back to, to 2015, I think even goes back to 2012 and it's in its infancy and how a lot of this was developed. Uh, I don't need to repeat it here. He has all the paperwork. Uh, I can't remember what the, but you can go online and, and download all the paperwork of all everything that he's traced. The reason is uh, redacted la letters to, to uh, Fauci uh, were CC'd to uh, many other people. They were able to get copies of those, they redacted them in different places, which meant they were able to piece together the entirety of these letters because they just kind of randomly redacted each person. So between his letter that was that was redacted and all the other CCs, they were able to come up with a complete storyline of everything that had happened. That is nefarious. I'm telling you the story is, is when you start to look into it, the, everybody's moving, they're, they're, they're lining their pockets with wealth in this and, and uh, we don't know what the future looks like with that, but it's very, very well documented in that. Um, I, I watched it about three quarters of the way through. He really started hammering down and they pulled him off of Facebook. And uh, I don't know if YouTube kept him. He still might be on YouTube. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. I don't know how long that would last. Anyway, like I said, long article, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. There's a lot of people that you're seeing every day in the news in various forms. You're seeing the, them as part of their businesses moving and shaking and causing different things. You're going to see Zuckerberg's name pull, pull up here, I think, in a minute. Yep, right in the middle of this page. So you're going to see person after person after person. They're all in, and they're all in on this WEF, and they are all be, had been gone through some kind of early training in preparation maybe for what we are going through right now. That is odd, and that shows of a different kind of spirit, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Boy, oh, I hear their music already. I'm like, oh, boy, I'm out of time. But I have, I have some more time, so if you bear with me. This, I know it's a long article, but like I said, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, it says, one of the goals of the current policies being pursued by many governments, Wolf believes, is to destroy the businesses of small and medium-sized entrepreneurs so that multinational corporations based in the United States and in China can monopolize businesses everywhere. Amazon, which was led until recently by uh, global leaders alumnus Jeff Bezos in particular, has made enormous profits as a result of the lockdown measures that have devastated the middle class. He says, Wolf contends that the ultimate goal of uh, this domination by large platforms is to see the introduction of digital bank currency. Just in the past few months, China's international finance forum, which is similar to the WEF, uh, proposed the introduction of the digital yuan. Uh, it says, which could be in turn... Uh, could in turn be internationalized by the Diem blockchain-based currency network. Interestingly, Diem is a successor to Libra. Do you remember that? That was Facebook said we're going to have our own currency, and it was called the Libra, or, or and and now it's called Diem. So watch that switch. You probably didn't notice it. It says a, a cryptocurrency that was first introduced by Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook, indicating that a global currency that will be will transcend the power of either the dollar or the yuan and manage through the uh, corporation of Chinese, European, and American business networks is currently being discussed. The International Finance Forum uh, Supervisory Board includes such names as the WEF, uh, Christine Lagarde, I already mentioned that, and John Cla uh, Claude uh, Trichet, the former president of the European Central Bank, and uh, Horst uh, Kohler, the former head of the International Monetary Fund. These are all top people as to what happens with your money. Wolf further explains that the lockdowns and the subsequent bailouts that were seen around the world over the past two years left many nations on the verge of bankruptcy. In order to avoid an economic catastrophe, the governments of the world res uh, resorted to drawing on $650 billion special uh, drawing rights, or SDRs, 
which are supplementary uh, foreign exchange reserve assets managed by the International Monetary Fund. When these eventually come due, it will leave the same governments in dire straits, which is why it may be that the introduction of digital currency has become a sudden priority. And this may have been the hidden person of the lockdown, uh, uh, purpose of the lockdowns all, all along. So uh, quite interesting as, as uh, certainly we, we go through that. Uh, there's some, um, let's see, I talked about Bill Gates, if I, okay, I did all that. Uh, before I get to this paragraph here, um, Wolf says that two European countries are already being prepared to begin digital currency, Sweden and Switzerland. And what's interesting about this, and I never thought of it, maybe this is going down a conspiracy theory line, but I'll go ahead and read what he said. Perhaps not coincidentally, Sweden has had virtually no lockdown restrictions due to the pandemic, and Switzerland has taken only very light measures. Wolf believes that the reason for this may be that the two countries did not need to um, crash their economies through lockdown measures um, because they were already prepared to begin using digital currency before the pandemic began. It goes on to say national governments, after taking loans from the central banks, have uh, introduced approximately 20 trillion into the global economy in less than two years. This is all around the world. Twenty trillion dollars has gone in. Uh, it's 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 where it's gone is different. Instead of the banks, it's gone to ordinary p people, which then they're spending on on uh, money on things, the food, which may be causing inflation. I think he goes on to say. Um, uh, let's see. And then, then we'll get into this. It says, now back onto the page, it says, the ultimate conclusion um, one must draw from all of this, according to Wolf, is that democracy as we knew it has been uh, silently canceled. And that although the appearance of the uh, democratic process is being maintained in other countries, the fact that an examination of how governments around the world works today shows that an elite of super wealthy um, uh, of super wealthy and powerful individually effectively control everything that goes on in politics as has been especially evident in relation to the pandemic response. So he, he certainly goes into this and says, wow, you know, looking at all of this, we have a big thing. Uh, one of the other articles that I, I've had for a while sitting in here, this is from November 9th, so earlier this month, um, the, the, this comes from a Russian magazine, but it says Western civilization is on the step of falling. Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin, in his recent speech, said that woke ideology is fast destroying the Western civilization. Putin condemned the far left progressivism and compared it to Russia's darkest day during the 1917 communist revolution in which Soviets seized the means of production and overthrew the government. Speaking at, at a uh, plenary session of the 18th annual meeting in uh, a meeting of the uh, Valdi International Discussion Club, Putin presented a strong case arguing that Western civilization is one step away from, uh, from falling. The theme of the discussion was global shakeup in the 21st century, uh, the uh, individual uh, values and the state. So interesting that a, from a communist country, uh, uh, the Russian leader is pointing out and saying, you guys are about ready to fall. We saw this when we became communists, if you will, all the way you know, in, in 1917, so uh, that was kind of interesting. Then I have this to add in, I know I still have it under the world title, but it's, it's kind of because of where we're going. You've seen this about the whole metaverse thing, um, utopia or uh, <laughs> dystopia, it says the realistic, uh, how realistic is Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse vision? Have you seen any of the ads or anything for that? It's, it's trying to basically take VR and, and put it into, into today's reality where you we could even do uh your conferences as a you know as your your um 
uh, alt an alternate person. You can make yourself to be whoever you want, and and but it's really tying into an alternate way of thinking and being and 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 all that. Now, it, I'm, I'm sure right now it would be probably kind of clunky, but the idea is that you create it and it'll get better and better and more involved and more involved and more into it. It's a sci-fi movie is basically the way he's trying to put it all together. So some of this uh, it says when Mark Zuckerberg announced ambitious plans to build the metaverse, a virtual reality. Uh, uh, um, construct intended to su uh, supplant the internet, merge uh, uh, virtual life with real life, and create endless new playgrounds for everyone. He promised that you're not going to be able, uh, or you're, oh no, you're going to be able to do almost anything you can imagine, which seems to me like you're really stretching outside of the word of God if you're that in, in that area. But anyway, uh, that might not be such a great idea. He says Zuckerberg, CEO of the company formerly known as Facebook, re uh, renamed it Meta to underscore the significance of the effort. During his late October presentation, he, uh, uh, he infused about uh, going to uh, virtual uh, concerts with your friends, uh, fencing with uh, holograms of Olympic athletes, best of all, uh, joining mixed reality business meetings where some participants are physically present while others uh, beam in from the metaverse as cartoony avatars. Anyway, this is the article that I said, keep in mind the whole Black Rock situation, but even beyond that, there's something else about this, and this is where I think all of this, there's a spiritual force behind all of this. It's consistent, it's worldwide, we've never seen anything like it in all of all of certainly our lifetime, but all of humanity, as far as I know, where the entire world is moving in, in concert with one another towards some direction. But this is Prince Charles at the COP Climate Summit in Glasgow, his speech transcript, and I pulled from the timestamp at two minutes and 40 seconds on November 1st, he said this, we also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green, here we need a vast military style campaign to march uh, yeah to march the strength of global private sector with trillion at his disposal. I thought that was very interesting at his who's his the Antichrist anyway, kind of interesting and then then I realized that the Blackrock guy has six trillion at his disposal, so maybe he's referring to him as a literal person. I'm not saying that he's the Antichrist. I'm just saying, but what is he talking about? This is the transcript. this is written down. he repeated it. this is these are the words that he actually said. It wasn't by accident that he said with trillions at his disposal, far beyond global GDP. And with the greatest respect, beyond even governments and world leaders, it offers the uh, the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. So how do we do it? First, how do we get the private sector all pulling in the same direction after nearly two years uh, now of uh, con uh, consultation? CEOs have told me that we need to bring together global industries to map out the very practical um, in very practical terms what it will take to make the uh, uh, transition. We know that the pandemic, um, we know from the pandemic that the private sector can uh, speed up timelines dramatically when everyone agrees on the urgency and the direction. So each sector needs a clear strategy to speed up the process of getting innovations to the market. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And um, I, we'll go to these verses. We're going to end here. I have so much more. I, it's, I have pages and pages and pages of stuff that I prepared for today. But, uh, and I knew I probably wouldn't get through it. So we, uh, maybe we'll debate as, as to on the 5th what we actually talk about, whether we break in or do one more week of this. But we'll see. I have a lot of stuff here. But um, a lot of reading today. There was a lot of stuff. I thought that article was shocking um, with the number of people that are in the world economy on, on every level that have been influenced by the World Economic Forum. So to me, I'm kind of like, wow, this is really something. I'll get to it in one second, Nancy. Um, this is one of the things, and I'll just read this first, and I'll get to your question, then I'll read into the second. But First John 2.18 says, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come by which you know that it is the last hour. That's what it feels like. 
It feels like there's a whole lot of people influenced by the spirit of Satan, if you will, that are working towards laying a platform where one world leader can come up. And it's, it's working in overtime, and they're taking advantage of every crisis there is to speed up that timeline, as Prince Charles just said. Wow, we were able to move really fast during this time. So expect more of that. But Nancy, go ahead. Yes. And they're um, now that you bring this up. I went through probably 40 different companies, huge, giant companies. They are either one, two, or three, or in the four of the first owners of every one of those companies. Yeah, it's it's amazing. There's so you can see where the control and the power is coming from in that. So it 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 certainly knows if they. If they're not following Christ, then who are they following, right? And so uh, we, we certainly want our leaders to be Christ followers so that we know that they're tied into the right spirit that is guiding them or leading them. I, I, I often refer back to um, the moment in which Daniel is praying and has, and has uh, Gabriel coming to him and saying, well, I was coming to you a lot. 21 days ago, but I got here today this long because I had to fight the prince of, of Persia. And uh, so who was he fighting? He certainly wasn't fighting the literal prince. He was fighting the power behind that, which I believe was Satan. And Michael came and helped him out, right? So he was able to go come and get this message. And he goes, I've got to go back because then the prince of, of Greece, Greek, the next, the next world leader that is coming on the scene, that's who's going to be behind him too. So you can see who's been behind all this, all this, all this time. Well, the, this is this is Satan's playground, unfortunately, is the earth, and and we know our our home is in heaven. Um, well, this this particular verse here, First uh, John four uh, one through six, I, I put all six verses in here because I knew after reading all that we were going to need something to hang on to and this is what it says beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world that is a true statement that is a statement in the word of God that was just as true in the first church as it is today probably more so today so keep that in mind so we we are called beloved right the the the, the church that we are called uh, to not believe every spirit and test the spirits. All right, let's go on and see. It says, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. It is not ever enough to say you believe in God. What God? Who is your God? That is that. So you get a lot of people professing to be Christians who say, yes, I believe in God. And they might even believe in Jesus Christ, but so did the demons. They called him out, but they did not believe in him, that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. They did not, they did not bow at his feet in that. Now, we know every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ and the Lord and Savior. No matter which side you're on, that's where it's going to be. Uh, that's, that's those who have already died will still bow before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have already done so in our heart, and, and we know, and we can test the spirits by finding out whether or not they confess Jesus Christ is the only way. And that's it. That's how. That's one of the ways. That's how you'll know. He goes on, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. That's what I think in those articles and the and the spirit behind the people, whether they know it or not. If they're not confessing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then they are subject to the movement of the Antichrist and that spirit. Whether it's for greed and gain, whether it's for 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 uh, uh, health and, and what they would perceive as happiness. It doesn't matter if it's not Jesus Christ that they serve, then they are subject to serving the other. That's it. There's no, no middle ground side. There's no gray area to walk in, especially not today. And so I think John was calling out the church to test the spirits in that day, and especially I think so today, to find out. It says, um, um, spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is already in the world. It has been here from before. It was here, like I said, during Daniel's day. It was here during Job. Job is the first book we have actually timeline-wise written in the Bible uh, uh, when, when that was written. It was there in the Garden of Eden. Satan has been working against mankind from the 
beginning. And so that's his goal. He stands before the throne of God, uh, 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 walking back and forth, it says, to and fro about the earth, and complaining about probably every Christian, saying, uh, how could you protect them? They're such a sinner. And, and Jesus says, I died for them, because he is the only way. It has to be through Jesus Christ. And it says, you are of God, in verse 4, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Praise God for that. That is that Holy Spirit. That is what marks us. That's what seals us. It seals us from all the evil that is around us. Know that you have that in you. You are ready for battle because Jesus is in you. And there is no defeat because we have victory in Jesus Christ. That is the only way. So we see all this and we go, wow, how do we defeat? I don't have the money to fight this. You're right. You don't. You have prayer. You have the word of God. And, we, and you have the spirit of God in you. And so we move in that way and we use that. And that's why it says he who is in you is greater than he is in the world. They that are of the world, therefore, um, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Is that not the truth? When these people speak, who's on the news? Well, it's the Jeff Bezoses and the, and the, and the uh, um, well, even the Elon Musk. And the, you know, it's all the, they're paying attention to those who have the wealth. Those are the guys we're going to listen to always, right? And so that's what they listen to, even when, um, even when uh, why just uh, Bill Gates is saying that he wants to uh, throw a bunch of basically debris into the earth to bring down global temperatures. And what, everybody's just going to believe him because he has the money and the means to do it? We don't question that. That's what I said. So that's, the world hears them. That's what it says. And then finally in verse 6 it says, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Listen to the words of God. These apostles, these writers of what we have in, in, in the book, in the book, the only book that matters, in the New Testament for us, the New and Old Testament combined, one full book, all of these authors, right? These 66 books written by over 40 authors. All of these are here for our learning. This is the word. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write them. I believe not one jot or one tittle will will not come to pass. It all will come to pass. That's what Jesus said. I've come here to fulfill all of the scripture, all of it. And so it will all be. And we're reading about things in the future as we look at Revelation. And I have, like I said, so much more that we were going to get into. But um, we'll see what everybody wants to do as far as the, when we meet together. But, but know this. That's how you're going to discern the spirit of truth and the spirit of air. There's a lot of spirit of air. And the world is listening to the spirit of air. The spirit of truth is Jesus Christ. And that's it. That's him only shall we serve. And so that's who we'll continue to focus on. Um, let's pray, and then we'll talk about maybe what we do in two weeks from now. So, dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for uh, basically just opening our eyes that really on every le level, there's a battle being fought against you. And we stand. We've drawn the line in the sand, and we stand with you. For without you, we are nothing. We are defeated. We are fodder. But with you. With you, we have, we have glory and strength. With you, we, we will fight to attain what you have for us, which is, which is, which is princes and princesses in, in the kingdom of heaven. It all seems surreal, but it's not. It's real. And what we don't see, what we could only ask that we might be, have a glimpse of is the angels that surround us ready for that battle as Elisha was able to show his servant standing on the hill that those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. So Lord, help each of us draw into the strength that is the spirit that is within us and know that indeed you have surrounded us with heavenly angels ready for battle and we win in victory because and only because of the name of Jesus Christ. We ask that you prepare us this week, that we enjoy our families, that we feel the blessings that you have provided for us, and that we share with one another the truths about who you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, God bless. Have a, a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into, uh, well, like I said, we can either start 1 Timothy or I can finish some of the other stuff uh, you can see. Um, I have quite a bit. If you look to the left there, we ended on, uh, uh, let's see, which slide are we on right now? Down. Oh, okay. So we have all this other stuff there. So I have an equal amount or more still that we could do if we wanted to do it. So maybe I'll just pray about it. You guys can text me or email me and let me know and we'll, we'll do something. Yeah, John. Uh, yeah, I'll try to, well, I'm going to even try to post it. So right now, goodbye to everybody online. God bless. And I'm going to stop recording.